What did Jesus say about the kingdom of God? The New Testament story begins with John the Baptist preaching the kingdom and closes with Paul's preaching the same message. These references bracket the ministry career of Jesus and of his first disciples in carrying out the Great Commission. The story depicts Jesus and the apostles as speaking about little else than the kingdom of God. The dawning of the long-awaited kingdom provides the rubric under which every other teaching finds its place. But in all of their talking, what was actually said? Much of what Jesus publicly taught on the subject was in the form of the parables for which he is famous. Most of the parables of Jesus compare the kingdom with familiar things like a farmer casting seed, a woman making bread, a small seed becoming a large plant, a merchant shopping for pearls, a landowner leasing his vineyard to tenants, or a king's preparing a wedding for his son. While the crowds no doubt found the parables to be homey narratives with which they could easily relate, the deeper meanings were generally opaque to them when presented without an explanation, as was usually the case. Explanations were intentionally withheld from the merely curious hearers on the hillsides and seashores, who must have often returned to their homes somewhat perplexed at how a teacher who only related simple tales about agrarian, social, and domestic life could have gained such a reputation for profundity. This obscuring of his messages in parables placed seemingly unnecessary limitations on the number of potential respondents to his message, a policy which perplexed the disciples. They asked Jesus why he did not make his meaning more accessible to the public. His explanation was that his hearers were divided into two categories, the curious multitudes and the disciples. He referred to these two groups as them and you, respectively. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Jesus had earlier told his disciples not to cast their pearls before swine, and he was apparently determined to suit his actions to his words in this matter. His secrets were not actually intended for public consumption, but only for those like the disciples who could be trusted with them. Not everyone would appreciate the things he sought to reveal to his trusted disciples, and anyone spearheading an invasion must not carelessly expose his own strategies to those in the enemy's camp. The principle upon which Jesus seemed to have acted was that those who are seeking the kingdom and who love the truth would come to him seeking further illumination. Those who do not love the truth are not worthy of it. This is how he would cull from the crowds those individuals who would qualify as future disciples. The explanation of the parable's meanings was reserved for the disciples, those who had demonstrated a degree of loyalty to Jesus by abandoning their former routines in order to follow and learn from him. To such disciples, Jesus regularly expounded the meanings of the parables in detail, answering their questions in private conference, as Mark relates. Without a parable he did not speak to the multitudes, and when they were alone he explained all things to his disciples. The Jews had been expecting the kingdom to arrive for several centuries, and the disciples no doubt initially shared the same default view, which they had learned from the rabbis. Interestingly, the things Jesus said about the kingdom in his parables did not accord with many of the most commonly held ideas in his day, nor ours, as to the meaning of the kingdom of God. For example, the kingdom, as Jesus spoke of it, was planted and would grow in the midst of an evil world, like wheat among tares, and would change that world significantly, as yeast changes a lump of bread dough. The kingdom is not a paradise somewhere in deep space to which people may hope to fly away when they die. As we have noted previously, the kingdom is not the same thing as heaven, though both exist as separate realities. There is no indication in Scripture that we will go to another part of the cosmos in order to inhabit the kingdom, but rather our prayer is that the kingdom will come as a historical development upon earth. Further, the coming of the kingdom as Jesus described it is not something delayed until the end of the world to be inaugurated at the return of Christ. Even while he walked among men, the kingdom had come near and was at hand. As Samuel M. Frost put it, The kingdom of God is near means the kingdom of God is breathing on your neck. Unquote. Jesus told his contemporaries that the kingdom had come upon them and that it was even then in their midst. Rendering the last reference, the kingdom of God is in your midst, follows all the major modern translations of Luke 17.21. Many may be more familiar with the statement in its older rendering, The kingdom of God is within you, King James Version. The term there translated within can also mean among or in the midst of, that is, within this crowd. 
The more widely accepted translation, in your midst, better expresses Jesus' meaning than does the ambiguous phrase, within you. Because of the influence of the older translation, the kingdom of God is within you, some have concluded that Christ's kingdom is strictly an interior spiritual state of affairs, something existing inside of and to be spiritually apprehended by God's people. However, the persons to whom Jesus addressed these words were his enemies, not his followers. Even though Christ's disciples do experience an inward spiritual benefit from being in the kingdom, this would not have been so for the hostile Pharisees to whom Jesus addressed his remark. The kingdom certainly was not within them. While it must be acknowledged that entering the kingdom of God is a spiritual transaction and involves the believer in a distinctive spiritual experience, the bulk of the biblical statements about the kingdom, for example in Christ's parables, would preclude our seeing the kingdom principally as a personal inward experience. The consistent language of scripture speaks of the kingdom as something that people must enter, but never as something that enters or is realized in the person. These observations by themselves serve as correctives to several of the popular views, which identify the kingdom of God either, one, as a post-mortem destination of the departed souls, as in the colloquial expression, he was blown to kingdom come, or two, as an eschatological phenomenon that has been postponed until the second coming of Christ, since such would not actually have been at hand when Jesus was here preaching, or three, as merely some vague aspect of private spirituality. So what is the kingdom of God? Though Jesus said numerous things about the kingdom, there were certain things that he did not need to say, because his hearers would likely have already known them. The principal point of his message was expressed in the word gospel, or good news. This word harks back to a messianic prophecy in Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Footnote. In the Greek Old Testament Septuagint, the expression good news in the second line of the prophecy is euangelion, the same word that is translated gospel in the New Testament. End footnote. Paul twice quotes from this passage, in both cases citing the Greek Old Testament, in which the phrase, Him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, is rendered simply, those who preach the gospel of peace. Paul interpreted this prophecy as referring to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, which Jesus preached, and which Paul himself was preaching. According to the last line of the prophecy, the content of the Messiah's good news is the announcement that God is enthroned and is reigning. Our God reigns. This is the gospel or good news, that the kingdom of God has come, just as Jesus proclaimed. Thus, when Jesus preached, The kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1, 15, the only gospel for which his hearers would have had any frame of reference would have been that which is predicted by Isaiah 52, 7, which happens to be the same message Jesus preached. Among the features of the gospel mentioned in Isaiah are the proclamation of peace, which explains why the New Testament refers to it as the gospel of peace. The proclamation of salvation, explaining why Paul refers to it as the gospel of your salvation. And its principal proclamation was, your God reigns. That is, God has become the king, reigning over the kingdom, which is why it is called the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is why when Paul preached the gospel to the Thessalonians, they correctly understood his message to be proclaiming, there is another king, one Jesus. The terminology and the concept of the kingdom meet us as unfamiliar ideas the first time we read the New Testament, unless we have already read the Old Testament. Neither the Old Testament prophecies nor Christ's words were novel or unfamiliar to Jesus' original hearers. His audience had been primed by the prophets to anticipate the arrival of a king and his kingdom, which is what they would have immediately thought of when hearing the proclamations of John, Jesus, and the apostles. The good news Jesus announced was unambiguously putting Israel on notice. The time for the long-awaited fulfillment of those promises had arrived. The word kingdom, Greek basileia, is an ordinary word that commonly describes a nation or society governed by a king, that is, what we call a monarchy. The word was first used in the Bible in the Septuagint, to refer to the ancient kingdom of Nimrod in Mesopotamia and of the Philistine kingdom of Abimelech. 
Later, the term is used referring to the Kingdom of Israel and the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Kingdoms were the most familiar model of nationhood in ancient times. Virtually all ancient nations had kings. Of course, most nations in modern times are not kingdoms and do not claim to be. More often they are democracies or republics, or dictatorships disingenuously assuming one of these more innocuous labels. There remain few actual monarchies in the modern world. It is a disappearing mode of government. Unfortunately, disappearing along with it is the real-life frame of reference for understanding the preaching of Christ. This was not a problem in biblical times. Throughout most of ancient history, a king was an all-too-familiar kind of governmental leader to whom absolute loyalty and reverence were owed by his subjects. The king established and enforced decrees and laws, and was expected to be obeyed by all in his domain. Kings were also charged with the national defense and the civic well-being of their territories and people. Unlike most modern government officials and leaders, kings were not elected by a popular vote, but reigned either by hereditary right or by conquest. In the days of Abraham, Moses, David, and the prophets, the powers of sovereign kings were well known by all. Kings in many cases had absolute power and could reign according to their wishes or even their whims without being accountable to anyone else. A king often answered to no man or parliament. This is what it means to be sovereign. America was founded by settlers who had been oppressed by monarchs in their European motherlands and who were determined to prevent the rise of any such sovereign power in their new world. They established a novel, king-free form of government. Eventually, many nations in Europe and elsewhere adopted a quasi-American model of governance. Today, a nation like Sweden is a constitutional monarchy, having a hereditary king as titular head of state, but whose role is limited to ceremonial and representative functions. For this reason, most of us who have only lived in modern democratic societies have little comprehension of what a king really was or what it meant to have one in biblical times. While we must be grateful for the increased liberties afforded by the modern constitutional paradigm, it must be acknowledged that this change of historical circumstances has left us at something of a disadvantage when it comes to grasping Jesus' message. As Jeremy Irons' character, Father Gabriel, in the movie The Mission, corrected the novice Jesuit Rodrigo Mendoza, played by Robert De Niro, the kingdom of God is not a democracy, unquote. The people of ancient societies who all lived under kings would more naturally have conceptualized the meaning of a term like the kingdom of God than would any modern person in Western civilization. Our historical memory of kings and kingdoms is fast fading from us. Footnote. Though some of our elected officials seem to be trying to reinstate the concept with themselves as sovereigns. And footnote. Along with the ability to instinctively understand the message of Christ's gospel. Today, familiarity with kings and kingdoms may be kept barely alive as portrayed to us in novels, legends, and movies such as King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, The Adventures of Robin Hood, The Chronicles of Narnia, and The Lord of the Rings. Quite apart from their entertainment value, such fiction may actually benefit us somewhat insofar as it accurately portrays the authority and dignity of kings, and the honor given them by their loyal subjects. The word kingdom refers to the reign and domain of a king, including two elements, a king and his subjects. Neither a society without a king nor a king who has no subjects can be called a kingdom in the proper sense of the word. The existence of both a king and subjects are included in the word's definition. A kingdom is properly defined as a society governed by a king, so that the simplest definition of the kingdom of God is that it is a society governed by God, either directly or through his appointed regent. A society means people. This is why God's kingdom is, in Scripture, identified as a unique people and a holy nation. The good news of the kingdom of God is simply that God, through Jesus' mediation, is reigning, and that he has acquired a specific community of people who acknowledge him as their monarch in their loyalty, words, and deeds. Many writers, when writing on the kingdom of God, emphasize only the fact that Christ is king, and regard his kingdom as merely a word affirming his kingly authority. Of course, it would be impossible to overemphasize the rightful authority of King Jesus, but the kingdom will not properly be understood if we fail to place proper emphasis also upon the people who comprise his kingdom. 
that is, his subject society or community. It is within this community that we can discover our own significance in history. The very first biblical reference to God having a kingdom identifies that kingdom as a people on earth, an alternative society, subject to God as their king and to his law. In the Old Testament, this society, Israel, is contrasted with the nations of the world, all of whom had merely human kings to whom they owed fealty. To preach that the kingdom of God has come, in the light of Old Testament prophetic expectations as Jesus did, is to proclaim that God has now exalted the Messiah to be the actual ruler over a specific society of people in this world, who eagerly embrace him in this role. Jesus referred to such people who have entered the society as disciples, the willing and loyal subjects of Christ as king. The collective of all disciples, those who comprise the kingdom, came to call itself the church, a term that, in the Old Testament, had formerly been used to speak of the gathered congregation of Israel. Footnote. See Matthew 16, 18, 18, 17, Acts 5, 11, Ephesians 1, 22, and 5, 24. The Greek word ekklesia had in the Greek Old Testament Septuagint referred to the congregation of Israel who also were called to be God's kingdom. By applying this word to the community of the disciples, Jesus indicated that they had taken over the status previously assigned to Israel. He stated this unambiguously when he announced to Israel, The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Matthew 21:43. We must be careful not to assume that the word church originally had the meaning that it came to have in later centuries, when the term has come to refer to a religious institution rather than to a body defined by genuine discipleship. End footnote.